Davis before we head to the stage of the Blackie to talk about your career, your films, and being uh, back in Liverpool. You've only for a brief, <laughs> brief sojourn. Um, you're just, you just finished Sunset Song. So if we will, you know, we can go back and we can talk about the films. But to be bang up to date, Sunset Song in the can. Finished filming? Um, well, it's we finished filming it, and I've I've done the um, the soundtrack. We've, we've mixed the soundtrack. We had to do that in Luxembourg uh, because they put a lot of money into the film, and we had to shoot all the interiors there. So we've just finished the soundtrack. So at the end of this month, November, um, we should be grading the picture, and then we should have a, a, a married print by before Christmas, I hope. Tell us the story of Sunset Song for those that might not have read the book. Well. Um, when I was growing up, on a, in my teens, um, they used to have a Sunday serial on BBC One on a Sunday night. Um, and I watched this opening episode called Sunset Song and was knocked out by it. Um, I just loved it. I waited each week to, for Sunday to come because I, I loved it. So I'd never heard of Lewis Classic Gibbon. I'd never read the book. And Vivian Hilborn played Chris. And I'd always wanted to do it, but I was still, I was 18 or something. But I mean, I was trying to earn a living. I mean, I, I wanted to do something in the arts, but I had no idea what, what that was. And I was a, I was a um, bookkeeper in a firm of accountants. Um, I just remember loving the, loving the book and lo loving the serial. And um, about 15 years ago, um, Bob Blast, who had helped produce The House of Mirth, said, you know, well, should we do it? I said, well, yes. I, so I, I got the money to write um, a first draft and then a, a final draft by 2003. Um, and um, we sent it to what was then the UK Film Council, who mucked us around for three months and then had the gall to say, it's not got legs, which I thought was absolutely outrageous. You don't say that even to a bad script. It's a very cruel thing to, to say. And it's the only time I've had a rant in the newspaper, in The Guardian. And um, I named this man because he, needs, he did need to be named. Um, and so he died. So I thought, well, it'll never, never, never get made. Um, and then when um, I made um, Of Time in the City with Roy Bolter and Saul Papadopoulos, they said, are there any other things that you'd like to do? I said, yes, there's this thing called Sunset Song, which I'd love. And this time it came to fruition. We still didn't have enough money um, to do it properly. I mean, the, the, the shooting was very, very strenuous. Um, and we had to do it in you know, New Zealand, in Luxembourg, and then two weeks in Scotland where it just rained all the time, you know, which is utter misery. You cannot imagine um, how miserable that is. And um, farm animals you know, in films look very, very nice, but you know, um, they urinate and defecate whenever they want to. <laughs> and at the end of one particular tender scene, the, the horse farted. And I thought, that's an opinion, I can just tell. It's such a glamorous life, isn't it, in film? Yeah, yes, you wouldn't believe. <laughs> And is it true you used the world's last uh, 65 mil stock for the film? Yes, I think we did. I mean, um, I, I'd been asked, I'd been sort of told really by someone, you know, you really shouldn't do this on a big gauge. So I said, OK, but you know, can we afford it? You know, I mean, 65 mil is very expensive, and so is the camera. And um, we managed to be able to afford it, but of course it cut off time for the shoot. You know, you've got to trade the one thing with the other. And when the cameraman, Michael McDowell, went out to Munich where they held the 65mm camera, everyone came out and looked at it, including the, um, the man who runs the company. And he gave us prime lenses. And we wanted to shoot all the interiors on high definition digital. And he gave us a camera and with prototype lenses, which no one will ever use again. So it looks magnificent. I, mean, I, I shouldn't say that, but it does. Um, every, you can see everything. It's just it, quite breathtaking, that. Um, so that was exciting, you know, because when you see it, see the rushes project for, for the first time, you think, God, I didn't realise it was that. It's, it's the same gauge as um, Lawrence of Arabia, but with no camels or sand. <laughs> <laughs> it's, I mean, I've said this a few times. This is you at your most prolific. The sense of time in the city, because you've got Sunset Song, which will be next year, be cinematic release, will it be 2015? 
A Quiet Passion, which um, the producers are sourcing the funding for now, and Mother's Sorrow, which is an adaptation of the Robert McCann book. This is Terence Davis at his most prolific. Does that... I wonder how it's happened. <laughs> I've got no clue either. <laughs> does it feel does it feel strange? Because if you go back and compare it with, you know, the trilogy of you know starting out and kind of, you know, as you say, working as a bookkeeper and then taking those first steps into film, does it feel different to be making films now than how it did in the seventies and eighties? Yes, uh, primarily because of course it's not. Autobiography, which is always different, but I mean that I've been able to work for eight years. I mean, no one would give me anything at all, and I think that did something to me. Um, I don't know what it is. I don't know what it did, and I think what it did, it did something very positive. But I don't know what that is. I, I just felt different when I was doing of Time in the City, which we were. I mean, I was writing it, the soundtrack as we were, you know, cutting the film, which I'd never, never done before, which I did find really exciting. But I do feel different. It's, I don't feel the same. But I don't know, I can't, I can't articulate what that difference is, but I feel different. I think it's, if we go back to sort of look at the trilogy, because I, the thing I find, I sort of rewatched the trilogy again in the last oh, couple poor of weeks. Thing. <laughs> Are you kidding? When I told you said to me, you get to you you know watch the uh, the sort of back catalogue for the interview. And I'm like, I get to watch all of Terence Davis's films again. <laughs> this is awesome. I love that. Um, but it's the thing I find really surprising with children. It's such a Terence Davis film. I know that sounds crazy, but it's your first film, and it is so you. The framing, the tone, the pauses. There's a moment in Children which I think is just heart wrenching. The moment when Robbie is sitting on the bus and his mum starts to cry, and it's about two minutes, and it is just wrenching. Talk a little bit about how you prepared for children. How did you start making that film? Well, um, I'd w always wanted to act and write, funnily enough. Um, and while I was at drama school, I'd written children. I didn't know how you wrote a script, and I don't know where it came from, it just came. I sent it all over England and everyone turned it down. And um, it's one of those things that, and it's really, really true, a little tiny thing can change your life. I was in Coventry, um, a drum school in Coventry, and I could only afford to come home once every three weeks, because um, the grants were small, but we got grants. And this particular Friday, it was the third week, and I thought, oh, you know, shall I go home? At the last minute, I thought, yeah, I'll go home. And I got in um, to the flat where, where Mum and I had, and I switched on the television. And it was a series called Cinema Now, and it was about the BFI production board. Off I sent my script. <laughs> Six months later, I was asked to go down to London. They, they had a, a little office just outside Waterloo Station, run by a wonderful man called Mamon Hassan. And I went in, I sat down, he said, you have eight and a half thousand pounds, not a penny more, you will direct. And I said, I've never directed before. He said, now's your chance. And apart from the cameraman, the crew gave me absolute hell. They loathed the script and they loathed the way I directed and they told me so every single day. Um, it was utter misery. It was utter, utter misery. Um, and I mean, I, I don't look at my own films because one can't, but I mean, when I think of that, shot. Now, it's two minutes, 20 seconds. I wouldn't dare do it now. I mean, I've always called it my Angora sweater shot because by the time it runs through the projector, you can knit one. It's, it goes on, it's interminable. Um, so I had all this 16 millimeter spaghetti and didn't know what to do with it. And the first editor was awful. He was, he'd been the sound man and he got, and it was just awful. He kept on shouting at me all the time. Um, it was awful. And I went back to the BFI production board and Mamun had left by then. And Peter Sainsbury said, you know, look, there is a good film in there. I said, Peter, I can't see it. I just think it's awful. You've wasted eight and a half thousand pounds, which in 1973 was a lot of money. And I felt really guilty. I thought, this is public money. And he said, well, would you be prepared to re-edit it? And I said, well, okay. He said, because he said, I think I know someone who would help you, a woman called... Um, Sarah Ellis, and we went through it, and um, I said, is there anything that, you know, you really feel that was not achieved in those cuts with this other man? I said, yes, this is the ending. I said, I, I wanted for him to be at the window 
after the funeral and dissolve and coming out and dissolve. She said, well, I don't think it will work, you know. And but those days you could send off tests and they would process them at the laboratory, get back you know, the next uh, two days later they came back. We'd done it. She marked up the dissolves and ca came back. And she ran through the projector and said, you were right, Terry. I cannot tell you what that meant to me. She was a lovely woman, lovely person. I said, I can't tell you what that meant to me for you saying that. She, it was, it's true. I still think it's too long at 46 minutes, and she's right. Um, but the very fact that, and I had done that on instinct. I didn't know where it came from. I just, I thought, I, this is what I feel right. That's what I said to the people, you know, on the crew. I said, look, this is how I feel it should be. But I mean, it's really depressing when, you know, you set up a shot and the whole of the crew go like this. Did you, it's... Because it, it's such an incredible shot. That's the one where it's the, the reflection in the, the glass. Um, no, um, the, um, when, at the very end, um, when he's at the window crying and we come out. Um, no, I mean, uh, people have said, uh, I've mentioned that shot too, but that was just sheer luck. I mean, I, I said that it, sh it should be seen, uh, they should be seen through the hearse windows and the, the coffin wiped the frame. It never occurred to me that the, on a sunny day there would be reflections um, on the top of the house, so you don't actually know where you are. That was pure luck. That wasn't designed. That was pure luck. Did you, when you started Children, did you know it was going to be a trilogy? No. So how, when did that start to emerge that it was going to be? Because it's, it's a, I mean, the autobiographical sense of it is, you know, for people that haven't seen it, it begins with, you know, Robbie Tucker as a child and then going through a sort of as his sexuality as it gets into Madonna and then death and atonement is death. You, as a sort of, in your late 20s, early 30s, thinking about your own death already on film. That, when did it start to emerge that it was going to be three films? Well, when I, when I finished it, I had to go back to drama school um, because those days, if you didn't finish the course, you had to repay the grant quite right too. And I couldn't afford it. I had to finish. Um, so I went back and finished my second year. And it was... Um, then that I sort of started thinking, I think there's more to be said. Um, but just excavating my own um, terrors, if you like. Um, anyway, I, you know, I, I started to write, and um, I was living in a box room. I lived in a box room for a year and a half, and it was so depressing. I, I had to come back to Liverpool because I, I just ran out of money. And I had to go back to bookkeeping, which the sense of failure, I can't tell you, was I just thought, I'm going to do this for the rest of my life. What am I going to do if this is all I've, all I've got to face? You know, mother will die and I'll be on my own. Um, and so it was all those terrors that I, I thought I can't face. I can't face them so film in reality. So like, sort of like an outlet of... But, but perhaps I can face them if I write about them. Um, and I applied for film school, didn't get in. I applied again, I got in the second time, thank God. Um, and that's when I made Madonna and Child, which of course, uh, uh, some of the governors said it should never have been made. It was disgraceful. Um, that's what they said. Um, but I needed to make it. Uh, I mean, it, it wasn't therapy, because I, I don't think it is therapy, and I don't think there's, there's certainly no catharsis, I can tell you that. But that was my terror. What, what if I spend my life in an office? This is what could happen. And some of those offices I actually worked in, were shot in where, we, where I worked. And one particular place, I would always got on with the people that I worked with, and they were all horrible to me. And I was really hurt. And the actor said, well, don't you realise why? I said, no, we, we got on. He said, you got out and they didn't. And it n that never occurred to me, but they were all really unpleasant. And that really hurts me still today, because I thought, you know, I made the effort if you want, didn't want to do that with your lives, you've got to make the effort, because no one's going to make that effort for you. Um, but it was finished, and then it went. It was accepted by the New York Film Festival, and they said, "Well, would you like to go?" And I said, "God, yes. I'd, I'd, I'd only been abroad once in 1966 when I went to Rome, and um, a little theatre um, downtown." And I arrived there. It was two shows. My first cue, my first cue, people waiting to get in. And then the second one, my first demonstration, these women from, you know, the American Society of Perennial Virgins, or whatever they were called, thought it was disgusting. Um, and um, <laughs> someone said, we don't know what bollocks are. You don't really want to know. <laughs> it's, it's and then it, it was, the, uh, 
It was very mixed because, you know, those days when I went to California, those days it was glad to be gay and all, then there were very militant, very hostile audience. And um, one of the inter <laughs> One of the reviews said, these films make Ingmar Bergman look like Jerry Lewis, which I think is a fabulous compliment. <laughs> it's, it's one of the things that I wanted to talk to you about, because when you haven't been brought up Catholic, it's really weird when you have been to explain how weird it is. Mm. And th there are lots of people who take a lot of comfort from being Catholic. Um, your mother is, you know, is one of those people. My mother is one of those people. Mm. But it is such a weird religion. And there is an enormous cultishness around it of the behaviour and um, the, the guilt that you sort of bring with you for the whole mm. of your life, even when you issue it. And the scene in um, Madonna when you have the Stations of the Cross and the, the guy talking about getting a tattoo on his penis. Mm. How did... <laughs> Because it's uh, there's one of the things that you do of the juxtaposition of two different ideas together. That's you know very much a, 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 a trope that kind of fits in all, a lot of your work. Where did that one come from? Because that's the first time that the faith really starts to, when you really start to talk about. Well, th th that was my parish church, Sacred Heart in Hall Lane. I, I, I worship there with my family, um, uh, and those and those sessions of the gospel, you know, high Victorian Catholicism, they're incredible, really. Went in for a, a small parish church, which seated 2,000, believe it or not. And I saw it full very often. Um, no, I was writing Madonna and Child, and I went up, I was, I'd come home for the weekend, and I wanted to go and see my eldest brother, and I got the wrong bus. And I realised when I got to West Derby Road that I got the wrong bus, and I got off. Um, I thought, well, I'll get the, the right one now. And these two young lads were in front of me, and they would have that conversation about having their genitals tattooed. Apparently, a lot of men want them tattooed. God knows why. Um, and it was the most extraordinary conversation. And I'm very good at remembering things. Repeat, if I repeat themselves, if I repeat it three times, I can remember it. I changed it in, in the sense of you know, the price going up, the price going, up, and then he says, you know, he won't do it. That was that was my. But it was such an extraordinary conversation that you know you can't forget it. You just can't. And I thought, well, if there is a, a great deal um, in Catholicism of sadomasochism, I think and the, the fact that you know the, the God we're supposed to worship gets crucified, which was you know an awful way to die. Um, so there's a, but it's made almost beautiful, and it's very peculiar that. And I thought, well, if I did that, if I went around that church, where I, you know, played, prayed until my knees bled because I was so desperate to be ordinary like everybody else, you know, I thought I know it will work. I don't know, but that was just sheer accident. And then you think, oh, when you hear something, you think, I've got to use it, I've got to use that, or someone will say something that will remind you of something. Think, yeah, I've got to use that, I must remember to use it. But that's how that comes about. It's like the use of music. You know, it, for some reason, when I'm writing, my antennae are out. And you think, that, that's it, that's, that's the bit I was waiting for. It's ex I'm very lucky in that respect. Well, the music's something we're going to come back to. But it's the sense of... You know, it's the, faith is the one thing that you, you do sort of return to in films. And sexuality, I mean, you've said you, you don't see yourself as a gay filmmaker. No. And, then you, and you're very adamant about that, that you're, you're a filmmaker who is gay, mm. rather than yes. defining things together. Is there a pressure within the industry that you have to define yourself in a particular way about that? No, I, I think that pressure comes from within the gay community, quite frankly, because, you know, um, you're supposed to be proud of it. Well, if people are, I think that's terrific. And I think, but young people don't know what it's like to grow up when you're actually a criminal. It was a criminal offence until 1967. So even though you had these, and even I did nothing about them, you were potentially a criminal. And no one knows like, what that's like unless you've lived under it. They just don't. And because I'm the sort of, I was the sort of child, and I think I am this sort of person, if I'm told, and I did believe in Catholicism, um, up until I was 22. These are the rules. This is how you earn God's grace. I really tried hard. I try. I cannot tell you how hard I tried. And the sense of utter hopelessness, of no sucker coming at all from anywhere, um, and feeling that I was be, I was beyond the love of God. Um, I found that unbearable. And it was only when I was 22 I went to um, night mass. They had night masses then, and I got to the offertory and I just remember thinking, 
and it's all a lie. It's just a lie, and I got up and walked out, and I never went back. Do you miss it? No. I think it's too pernicious to miss. The, the, it's the residue that I really resent, the guilt. The only other people who know what guilt is like are the Jews, because they have it as well. But Jews and Catholics always understand that between each other. They just do. Um, but no, I, 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 I suppose... What I do regret is that sort of assurance that, you know, if I do all these things, you know, I will be saved. Um, but then all, all sorts of things you stop believing in simply because you get old. You know, I mean, uh, when I started first listening to classical music, I used to listen to Record Review on Radio 3 um, every Saturday morning. And if they said this was the best performance of this... Well, they, it had to be, because they wouldn't lie, it was the BBC. You know, um, I believed it with a great passion. Um, but that's that starts to go as well. As you get older, those things go. And um, all those assurances that you had vanish or they disintegrate. And that's the difficulty. That's what you have to come to in the end to face what you believe. And I believe there's only oblivion after, after death. I don't believe there's anything beyond that. And I just hope I don't die painfully. It would be nice to die not in pain. Um, what I hate most is the kind of rituals that go with particularly English funerals, they are particularly dismal, I think. Um, it always seems I to rain. Want, I it always want, seems to yeah, rain at an English funeral. And I wouldn't want that at all. I've, I just want to put in a cardboard box, take an out bird, that's it. I, and I, that's what I will have. Because I just, that, I, I think, just, just get rid of me, you know. Um, none of this nonsense about requiem masses and, uh, and angels flying up to heaven. I think, what a load of old tripe this is now. <laughs> it's the sense of sexuality and outsider status, I think is quite interesting in your films. Um, Robbie Tucker, obviously, sort of as being you in the autobiographical. Um, Heston Collier in um, Deep Blue Sea. Um, Lily Bart in House of Earth. There is this sense that the, 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 the sexuality in some way puts you outside of a societal norm, outside of this kind of mainstream that we're all meant to um, aspire to. Are we hugely weird about sex? I mean, why, why is that sort of... Where does that outside in us come from? Well, it, I didn't realise I was. It, but even as a child, I, I looked... I was the youngest of, you know, seven children. You know, um, and when you're the youngest, you know, you listen. I listened all the time. Um, I didn't realise I was doing it. And when my family were talking about what, how my father behaved, which were, were just the extraordinary stories, they sort of became mine. Um, and I listened, and I looked all the time. If I went to the pictures, um, I would remember swathes of dialogue and scenes. And I thought everyone did that. I just thought everyone did that. Um, it was only when I realised that I was gay that then I really knew I was not part of this. Um, and that was hard. And I still am not part of life. I'm, I'm an observer. I'm not a participant in life. Um, I really am not. Um, I don't do anything dangerous. I'm too frightened to. I'm not, you know, drugs, and I'd just be too frightened to. You know, um, I don't do sex because I'm celibate. Um, you know, what's left? You know, self furnishing. That's not terribly exciting. <laughs> you know, and if any, anyone is ever mad enough to write my biography, it will be a leaflet, not a book. <laughs> I, yeah, I mean, it's. I, I do find it one of those sort of sense of, you know, you. You said, we've said, like when we've spoken about it, you said I'd quite like to make a mainstream film. What do you think that'd look like? Oh, God, I think it'd be probably a mess, probably. <laughs> you know, I was once sent a gangster script. I mean, what do I know about gangsters <laughs> and the underworld? Script? Oh, God knows. But I, I said, look, what do I know about gangsters and drugs? You know, if there were a car chase, it would be two cars going slowly. That's not foot tapping. <laughs> um, but why they sent it to me, God knows. I know nothing about the underworld. Um, no, I... I I, I don't think I've got the talent to make a, 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 a mainstream film. It takes a certain sort of talent, and that is talent. You know, there's no question about it. I just can't do it because uh, I don't. I don't perceive narrative in that way. I mean, I don't. I just don't. I'm not interested in if people come out of, a, you know, out of a house. We have to cut out. They get in the. They drive away. They arrive. I mean, that's geography. It's not drama. Um, and I'm interested in the intensity of the emotional moment um, and not filling. The, the, the audience, that's for the audience to do. If the audience is just passive and told everything, then what's the point of making it? You have to say, look, you've got to finish, 
You've got to complete the act by interpreting what you see. Even if you'd hate it, you've got to interpret it. And that's what I think is interesting about any art form. But if you're told everything, then you just remain constantly passive. I mean, television, you're constantly passive. Because there's the, it's not drama, it's all exposition. In the last five minutes, they tie up all the loose ends. But it's all exposition. Well, what's, what's interesting about that? Nothing. It's going on to that sort of the non-linear sort of structure lot of your films. Distant Voices, Still Lives, is sort of the epitome of that for me, because it is just like snatches of memory. Um, we talk a little bit about that film because particularly the music in Distant Voices is heartbreaking. The song, the, the song at the beginning with the, um, um, it always rains when I think of you, that, it, it just the most beautiful song. And it just breaks your heart when it comes on. Well, I mean, th that was just what it was. I mean, people did sing. I mean, all my family had good voices, with the exception of me. I sing everything in the key of Z, you know. Uh, but they all had good voices, very mellifluous they were too. And uh, what was lovely about that, those, up until Elvis Presley and the Rise of Rock and Roll, the great American songbook was about poetry for the ordinary person. It spoke to their hearts, and people they were written so that they could be reproduced by ordinary people who could sing and like those particular songs. And you knew that certain songs were someone's personal song and you knew what were group songs. It, it, you just knew it. And those days, even as late as, you know, uh, the late 50s, when you still could buy 78s, the lyrics were printed on the back. Um, uh, pop music isn't meant to be reproduced, no, it's just not. But then it was. Um, so I grew up with all that. I mean, people used to say on the continent that England was a land without music. Well, that, w that wasn't true. Um, and so I grew up with all those songs, so I knew them. And, and also, you know, I loved the radio. Um, and, those, and those days, it was BBC, um, the live programme and the home and the third. Um, and those days, I mean, you only switched it on for a particular programme. You, you leave it on, you just switched it off. And if anyone came, you switched it off. You just did. Um, so uh, what I remember, uh, my mother used to be the first person up when we were still at home. And sometimes I used to get up with her. Um, and she'd switch on the home service, which began with Lift Up Your Hearts. And then that wonderful well, shipping forecast, which I adored. I mean, I had no idea what it meant, um, but I found it terribly erotic. <laughs> <laughs> Fair Isle Cromarty thought is over. Yes, every time, I said to myself. Um, and so, uh, as soon as you hear that, and the way in which it's delivered, you're back in 1950s, you can't, you're not in pres the present time. And my mother always sang, I get the blues when it's raining. And um, about four years after she died, um, I bought some bows, a, a bows, CD player, and they give you um, a test disc. And someone was singing the blues when it's raining. I had to switch it off. I couldn't listen to it. Um, but so I grew up with that, uh, and I grew up with listening to stories of, and they were just snatches. Remember what they were, and I didn't realise because I was too young that it's the intensity of the moment. Before and after doesn't matter. It's the intensity of the moment, and that's what, and that memory is cyclical. It is not linear. One memory, one emotional memory feeds into another, and it's cyclical. But there has, there is beneath it um, a logic, an, an emotional logic. There just is. And trying to capture that, that's what I wanted to do. Also, I was heavily influenced by um, Four Quartets by Eliot, I mean, which I read regularly. They're, it's some of the greatest poetry written in English, and it's about the nature of time and memory and mortality and all sorts of things. Um, and when I was 18, I, we had we just got a television, and over four nights, Alec Guinness read every one of them from memory. I was knocked out by them. Both, I had no idea what they meant, and I read them at least once a month now. I think they're just glorious. And they feature enough time in the city as well, don't they? Yes. You quote them as on them. It's, I mean, distant voices as well, the most astonishing cast. I mean, re-watching that now, it is just a who's who, both of Liverpool theatre, <laughs> and it, I mean, Pete Pottleswaite just, he looks so vicious, his face seems to change, and he looks so hard and tough in it as well. It's one of the things that's really incredible about Distant Voices is, at the heart of it are incredible performances. 
it's such an incredible group of actors together. How did you, I mean, Pete Pothelswaite, who plays the father in it, who's the, the tyrant, um, and it's, in some ways it is a film sort of about you know, his children's reaction and his family's reaction to him, mm. um, of, you know, the, the eldest daughter's wedding day, and she's, you know, I wish my dad was here. Or the younger one, <laughs> I don't. Yeah. It's, how did you talk about getting that sort of the, the cast together for that? Well, the difficulty in terms of writing it was because my father was so violent, he was psychotic. Had I put all the things in, nobody would have believed them. They just would not have believed them. I had to cut it down to the bare minimum. Um, and um, I met him, and um, he was very frosty on me, and clearly didn't want to do it. And I said to the producer, he obviously doesn't want to do it. He changed his mind, but um, it was, shall we say, difficult. Um, the others I just auditioned, they came in. I auditioned them, and I knew what, they were the right ones. Um, it, you can tell. I don't know how you can tell. But someone comes in just thinking, yeah, we found, we found them. We've just found them. Um, I don't know how. I still don't know how. And to me, it's still magic. Um, but the one thing that was, and I don't believe in predestination, but it was, let's say, a happy accident. I'd always loved Frida Dow. She never was a big star, but every time she was on television, she was always good. And um, I just remember thinking, you know, she's a, she's a good actress. I'd love I'd to work with her one day. Anyway, I, I, I was in the BFI. I said, can you pass me the female um, spotlight? And it was passed by. I dropped it, and it opened to Frida Dowie. And that's the truth, honestly. And I rang her up. I said, will you do it? She said, do you want me to audition? I said, no, will you do it? She said, yes. And what was lovely, she imitated um, my mother's voice very well, uh, so much so that when we played it at her funeral, um, my family thought it was my mother. I said, no, that's, that's Frida. It's such, it's, a, it's an incredible film, just in voices, because when you sort of watch it, and it's one of those films that you, you, know, you watch when you're sort of getting into, you know, our house cinema and that kind of thing, and your reaction to it changes as you get older, because there is that sense of, as you get older, bits of life that disappear and you never get back. Mm. Things of you know being a childhood, a friend that you'll will have moved away and you'll never see again. How do you how do you try and capture that emotion as a filmmaker? I know that's probably like a really hard question to answer. How do you try to without getting too fawning? Because it's easy when you're talking about nostalgia in the past and being a kid and your parents when they were in their prime. It's easy to get sentimental. Yes, it is, um, and that's the, that's the danger. I just remember thinking, well, it's got to be the intensity of the moment. It's always got to be that. And as I said, to, as I said I've, I've said on every film, don't act, I don't want you to act, be. That's much more difficult, but it's truer, because then it will be, it's felt, it's really felt, and they'll do things that they hadn't, weren't aware of, but that's, that's what film captures. It captures the fleeting moment, you know, um, and that's wonderful. I just said, don't act. No, no the, this is what happened, play it like that. Um, and I remember Peter saying, well, you know, I, I, I don't think this happened when he beats Maisie. I said, there's my sister's number, ring her. He broke a yard brush across her back, ring her now. And that was then not spoken about. Has everything in it literally happened? Maybe not in that order. But it happened, and it, I had to leave a lot out. Um, but it's, and this is something that's very difficult to explain. You know what happened, but when you're constructing a narrative, narr there has to be a narrative truth, which is not literal truth, or what actually happened, or how they spoke, or whether they looked like this. Or None of that matters, but it does feed into narrative truth. Um, and I, I don't know how I did it, but I was able to, I think, keep in my mind what literally happened and narrative truth. And what, for instance, when my sister took me to see Love is a Many Splendid Thing, it was not raining. It was a beautiful Saturday afternoon. And we were in, in a queue waiting to go into the Scala. And we got the last three seats. And it was beautiful. We came out and it was still sun, sunny. But my first film was Singing in the Rain. And so I thought I had to get 
umbrellas in and do, I, I, so I've got to get that in. Um, and when we were setting up the, <laughs> the shop, the cameraman said, could the umbrellas <laughs> move? And I said, all right, we'll do a take where they move. I said, no. I said, no, they can't move because you're wondering what they're doing under the umbrellas. And they look like novelty condoms. I said, they've got, they've got to remain still. So that, that was not true. I mean, uh, when we get inside the cinema, it's just my two sisters, but they actually took me. Um, but those memories in Distant Voices of Love weren't mine. I heard them. I, I experienced some of the, the violence of my father. Um, it was only when we got to Long Day Closer that that was just me and my other two brothers and sister. Um, so it's, it's trying to keep the truth, the literal truth, as well as the narrative truth. And sometimes, you know, they, you have to go for narrative truth because the, uh, the people are watching a story. Whether it's about my family or somebody else, it doesn't matter. You've got to be true to the story. When, this is going to sound like a really open question, <laughs> when you sort of got to the end of Long Day Closes, because I know when Hurricane Films first came to you at the time of the city, you said, I've done the Liverpool films. I'm not going back to Liverpool. No. Did it feel when you'd done you know, the trilogy and Distant Voices Still Lives and Long Day Closes, did it feel, did any of that feel cathartic? No. Or did it just feel worse? No, I just thought all that suffering, what was it for? Still do. Don't look at them because I can't watch my films. No, I mean, I just can't. But I just thought, all that suffering, what was it for? You know, because suffering has no meaning. It doesn't make you a better person and other people, you know, um, more civilised. It's just your, it's your tough luck that you had a horrible man as a father or, or someone psychotic and kills your, your, your sister or your best friend in a tube station. It's quite arbitrary. It's quite arbitrary. That's the worst thing of looking back and thinking, what, what was all that misery for? What did it achieve? And it achieved nothing. Let's go to, let's go to Jolly. Let's go to, um, back to music a little bit, because you have what seems to be an encyclopedic knowledge of music. <laughs> and it, it, it's really of a time in the city when just this, it's so, it feels like it's all your artistic loves come together, I think, in that film. Because there is the Elliot in there, and there's the Marla, and you know, the Peggy Lee and the music. How did you talk a little bit about how you made of Time in the City? Because it is just, it's an astonishing film. Well, when they rang me um, and said, you know, Hurricane Films, and we would you like to do a, a drama set in Liverpool? I said, no. I said, no, not interested, sorry. Um, and um, that was that. He rang back again and said, do you have any other ideas? I said, well, I thought of some kind of documentary. Um, and I thought, oh, God, what have I said? <laughs> I said, leave me to think about it. And we were driving along. Then my manager was driving me along. And we stopped at the lights. And I remembered that um, in, the, in the late 50s, throughout the 60s, there was a big slum clearance throughout the north, not just Liverpool. And I remembered Peggy Lee singing the folks who live on the hill, because I remember going out, it was in the mid-50s, we'd just come back from mass, and mum was cooking the breakfast, and everyone listened to um, family favourites on Sunday, everyone did. And I, it was a lovely sunny Sunday, and I came out into the street, and every house that had a radio, you could hear Peggy Lee singing the folks who live on the hill. I thought, we've got a sequence. And at that moment, Saul rang. I said, yeah, I'll do it. And they said, well, 156 people have applied. I said, well, you can whistle goodbye to them giving us the money, because I've never done a documentary before. Anyway, we got it, as you know. Um, but it was, it was hard. It, it was hard. Strange things prick your memory. Um, just strange things. Um, like my, we, those days, you, there were no betting shops. Um, you had to bet on course. And, Betting, of course, was illegal, um, but everyone had a bet on the national, everybody. And there used to be this little man in this little coat and this hat, owned by Carhartt's factory where my sister worked. And you went up and you gave your step, and she had, you know, a shilling each way on Queer Times, and it won. She won five shillings, I remember. And I thought, oh, could you get me some uh, footage of Queer Times winning the national? 
Um, and then that started, that started other things. So it was just, it was associative, really. That's how it, that's how it happened. Um, but the, the first big sequence was really um, the folks who live on the hill. And then we were told that we, can't, we couldn't clear it. We had to ride to her estate. So I wrote, and I told them in the, what had happened when I first heard it. And I've loved it ever since. Um, I've always loved it. And they wrote back and said yes. Because I, I had, they said no, we'd have had no sequence. There just wouldn't have been one. Because that ties it together, because it's about a family from when they first get married to when they're old. You know, and I've always found it one of the great American songs. You know, um, it's poetry. Mm. Well, it's the mar the Marler for me is the thing that sticks in that film because it's it's so powerful <laughs> and it's so masculine. The Marler as well. <laughs> yes. It, it's, it's so majestic and it's this thing of you know the city at the height of its you know pomp and this huge music sort of echoing along its streets. I mean, you had the most amazing archivist on of time yes. in the city as well. Yes, who was he was just fantastic. And you talked about how you made it differently from any other film you made of Time in the City in the edit suite. Yes, yes, we did. I'd say, could you get some, uh, uh, I would say, bonfire night. All this stuff would come. He was Jim, De, De, um, Jim Anderson, really, really marvellous, marvellous man, as well as a great archivist. He did wonderful deals for us. And Ian Neal did wonderful deals on the music as well. They were just artists, they're both artists. Um, but it was, what was odd was that certain things happen. Now I said, look, g can you go down to, um, what's, th what's the street that uh, the cavern was on? Matthew, Matthew street. street. There's a confluence of five streets at the bottom. I said, well, could you just go out and shoot something, you know, um, at the weekend? And they're all going into clubs, and all, I, I, I thought oh, they were rather, rather well behaved, I thought. I thought, oh, they're a nice crowd. Um, and we got, we got that, that in, and that, the, the night before, I, w I was just reading, I can't remember what it was, um, but it, I, it was some Walter Raleigh, um, a poem by Walter Raleigh, his re response to Christoph, uh, Christoph uh, uh, no, The Jew of Malta. Yeah, I was going to say Christopher Wren, but that's completely Christopher. wrong. Christopher. Oh, for heaven's sake. He's one of our greatest playwrights. I anyway, him. <laughs> <laughs> and who wrote, you know, come, with, come live with me and be my love. And this was his reply to it. And I just thought, that's where it should go. You know, that's where it should go. You see everyone going out and they're young and they're full of life and full of expectation and hope in the world. And, you know, the response is, you know, well... At the end of it all, you know, what is there? And there's loss, basically. Christopher Marlowe, sorry. Sorry, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> it was, did the response to Of Time in the City surprise you? Yes. Because it was astonishing. I mean, the, th the story that um, Mark Como, the film critic, always tells is when it was on at camp. And um, Sol and Roy were too terrified, weren't they? They were too frightened to watch um, the premiere at Cannes. And they went outside. And the thing, if you've, people who haven't been to Cannes, it's when the, um, the seats slap as people are yeah. leaving. Yeah. And Mark Hermade comes out of the filming and just looks at them and goes, and it's, it's a masterpiece. And just looked at were you, what, I mean, because you'd had eight years from House of Mirth to Have Time in the City. Did you think that you would have this sort of... No. No, I was, it, you're sitting there thinking, oh, God, who's going to leave next? You know, it's terrifying. It really is terrifying. Um, no, I didn't. I just thought, as long as it's OK, as long as it's OK. Um, but there were people you know, who you know, didn't like it. You know, lots of people think it's a load of old twaddle. Um, no, I, I, you never think that. You just hope that people won't hate it. I, I, I got some... one or two, on the whole, very, very good reviews, but one or two which were really vicious. I mean, really vicious. And you think, blimey, um, what was that? But then you have to ask yourself the question, if I were that critic and I had been to see my film and I didn't like it, would I say so? And I said, yes, I would. So you can't complain. You just can't. Um, but it, it can hurt. It can hurt very deeply. Um, 
because you can't please everybody. I mean, you just can't. And there's lots of people who hate what I do. They think it's far too slow and boring. They do, because they've, they've said so to me. Weirdos. Yes. <laughs> so, or, or they've written it. You know, people who, and people can be very, very cruel. You know, um, oh, I, I see your film's out. Hasn't lasted very long, has it? Terrence, do you not Thanks. think it's weird that you won't watch your own films, but you'll read all the critic reviews of it? No, no, I don't. I don't, I don't read the critical reviews anymore. That, that last one, I just thought, there's no point. I, and so I never read reviews now. Ne just never. I never read them. So we've got... So post of Time in the City, we have um, Sunset Song, obviously next year, Quiet Passion, which is the Emily Dickinson... I'm calling it a biography. Is that right? No, it's not really. Um, it, it's, it's my interpretation of her life um, because you know, she was virtually a recluse towards the end. And I think America's greatest poet. Um, she wrote 1,808 poems and only seven or 11 were printed in her lifetime. You know, I mean, how she carried on, I do not know. But it's a very curious household, you know, because she lives with her sister, Vinny, um, her brother lives next door. He builds a house next door and they live next door, you know. Um, and there's a schism in the family because he, the brother Austin has a, a love affair with someone in the town, and you know, it really splits the family. Vinny is all for um, Austin, and Emily is for Austin's wife, Susan. She, it causes a huge, huge schism. Um, but it's, the, it's what, what is great about her work, I think, is this, she does have a kind of Christianity, but it's very ambiguous. She, you know, she wonders about what will happen once we're dead, but wants, to be, wants her soul to be prepared um, and not sully it at all. It's really, it's a very strange um, position because she sees the world like all great artists do with a, a, a layer of skin off and you know, she can see what the world is like and it's not pretty and it's cruel and it's unfair, you know, but she, there's a part of her which hopes that there's some meaning to this. Um, she's a great, great poet. There is something, I mean, there's something about incredible female writers that seem so modern. When you take them out of their historical context, Jane Austen's another one. You could, there are some letters that you can read from Jane Austen and you'd think they were written yesterday as an email because it's just so biting and so insightful. But I suppose that's what sort of art I've always matters. found um, Austen very resistible, I must say. I prefer the Brontes. The Brontes are vicious. But they're much more powerful. And Got much more because I can't bear all that sort of ma man stuff about you know who you're going to marry and Gloria Lopez. I couldn't give a toss. You know, I really couldn't. Um, I'm, I've never been a fan. I know she's the great mistress of form and all that, but I, I, I want passion, and you get passion from the Brontes, and that's what I, that's what I prefer. And more terrifying male leads. Can you imagine Darcy and Heathcliff in a fight? I wonder <laughs> who'd win that fight. <laughs> And then the other one is um, A Mother's Sorrow, which is on your website. That's the Robert McCann book. Yes, well, it said I'd, I hadn't read him, and he sent it to me out of the blue, quite frankly. And there was a, there's a, a, a company in London who wanted to do something with me. We couldn't find anything, so I said, well, you know, thanks for asking, but it looks as though nothing's going to happen. Anyway, this book came out of, out of the blue. And I was reading it, and I thought, because it's a collection of short stories, which actually works as a novel. I thought, this is, I think this is pretty good. And it was the ending that made me realise I could, uh, when I'm reading a novel, I know what the shots are. If I know what the shots are, I know what, I can do it. And it's a lovely, lovely ending. And I said, I think you should look at this. And they looked and said, yes, we want to do it. <laughs> you're, going to, you're going to really hate me saying this. Um, but I don't care. Um, I think you are Britain's greatest living auteur director. <laughs> oh, fuck you. Because the, the style and the complete, the, you know, no compromise. You are so completely with your style. How do you feel about your film career? Because there have been ups and there have been downs and there has been autobiographical, there is the fiction. What do you, how do you sort of tie it together? Do you tie it together? No, I don't. I mean, if, if I compare myself with other people, I'm the also ran. I am. You know, I, you know Mike Lee, Ken Loach, Steve McQueen, 
Peter Greenaway, they've all won major prizes, they've all, the critics love them, the audiences go and see them. I'm, I'm, I'm an also round compared to them. I feel like they also round. That seems like a sad place to finish it. Do you feel like, does it feel like, I mean, because now, because it's having had a period of time, almost a decade, where people wouldn't give you money to make films, and now, you know, it's easier to source money. Does that feel, do you have a greater confidence with that? Do you, do you no, feel like you approach it, it differently? It's, not, it's still not easy to raise money. It, it isn't. You know, it's always difficult, especially if you're not in the mainstream you know, and you don't put names in the film. You know, I cast the people who give the best auditions, or usually one or two people that I don't audition, but I just know they're good. Um, and it goes, the rest, it, those roles go to the people who do it best at the audition. Well, that's not how you uh, garner money, because they want names. You know, you, you, at the beginning of every casting session, the same names are on the list, and you think, oh, not again. And I just take them out and say, look, there's no point. There's no point in me casting these people. It's pointless. Um, but you get better results by casting the right people, you know. Um, you just do. I, I think. I think it's truer. Um, and when they're eager as well to do good work, and they always are, that's that's an inexpressible joy. Anyone you still want to work with? Well, I usually don't work with people more than once. I've worked with Marjorie Yates twice um, because once we've they've done a film with me, they should go on and do other things. That they've got to. They can't just keep on doing the same thing. Um, you say, look, you look at Liv Ullman, you know, worked all, all that time with Bergman. When she's in other things, you just don't believe it. It's, it's all wretched and angst-ridden. And you think, you know, she's, she did too many films with him. And that's the danger. They've got to go out and do other things with other directors, with other scripts. They've got to, because that will keep them artistically alive. Any actors that you've got your eye on that you think... I mean, because I suppose when you start to have ideas for things like, you know, Mother's Sorrow, do you start to look at actors and think, oh, maybe you and perhaps I like what you're doing there and maybe I put you in this or...? Um, yes, it doesn't happen very often. I mean, I, I approached Cynthia Nixon for um, Emily Dickinson. She said, yes, so she, um, and she said, do you want me to read it? I said, no, I want you to do it. Because she actually looks like her, um, which is extraordinary, because only one extent photograph of Emily Dickinson when she was 17 and she had red hair although the, the daguerreotype is black and white and Sol superimposed her face with um, Cynthia's and they look exactly exactly like one another and she's been wonderful she's you know I had to do this film first for all sorts of reasons um, and so she's waited a long time to do it but you know she's absolutely committed to it but all the rest of that cast still have got to be cast. And then after Mother Sorrow anything? Oh gosh there's nothing, there's no, uh, not, not at the moment anyway. Um, by the time I finish that, I'll be in my 70s, you know. Just said, older than God, but with none of the influence. It's not fair. <laughs> Let's finish it there. <laughs> Good place to finish off. <laughs>